Erev Tov Chavri, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Glad to be back in the office here in Orlando, taking some time out to do some very intense research. Got some very interesting messages coming up on the Noon Institute this week. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, but specifically today, this is where the news is happening. And friends, I am so concerned as I listen to different broadcasts that are going on, listening to uh, are reading the different news insights out there about Jerusalem being declared Israel's capital, about uh, the UN, in this case here, Jerusalem, U.S. vetoes UN resolution rejecting Trump's declaration. Uh, we know that President Erdogan following suit with uh, uh, China's President Xi Jinping declaring the East Jerusalem as the Palest Palestinian capital. Uh, and Yet, as, as all this is happening, people are really having no idea that there's already a two-state solution been signed years ago. All the way back from the time when we reported this about uh, Shem uh, Ariel Sharon when he was prime minister. We shared that with you. We're going to go in that tonight. Uh, we're going to go back into Joe Bainerman's writings from the... Uh, from the time when the Oslo Accords were the distraction while the Vatican and, and Israel were negotiating for a two-state solution. And they had already declared that there was two states and that uh, it would be that West Jerusalem would be Israel's capital, East Jerusalem would be Palestine's capital. And as I've been hearing the different things that are being stated out there, some going so far as to say, wow, you know, I mean, the world leaders are declaring uh, East Jerusalem, the Palestinians' capital, which indirectly points to West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Like that's some great thing to say that. No, you're missing the point. And I realize, no doubt, good people that are trying to, to analyze this. But friends, what you're missing, what many people are missing, and this is something that by God's grace I want you to see. Those of you that, that, that listen to this channel, that trust that we do the research to try to really tell you the truth, looking at prophecy, looking at what's happening in the news, and then at the same time, analyzing this information and making sense of it. Now, we've shared with you for years now that Israel was already divided. There was already a Palestinian state, already a Jewish state, uh, and this is really a done deal. It happened under Ariel Sharon. We're going to get into that tonight. Uh, we know that East Jerusalem was already declared the capital of the Palestinians and West Jerusalem, Israel's capital. We know this all the way back from 1993-1994, Shimon Peres, Ahab's own son, negotiating with the Vatican to do just exactly that. And that was a done deal. We're going to examine Joel Bannerman's report. And the man was assassinated in order to shut him up because he was revealing the Vatican's role and what they're trying to do with Jerusalem. We know all about Pope Pius XII and his wanting to internationalize Jerusalem and make sure the Jews couldn't get there. Going to be getting into that tonight as well. But what's happening right now with People like, in the case of here of er President Erdogan of Turkey, President Xi Jinping uh, of China, declaring that East Jerusalem is Palestine's capital, that's not saying that West Jerusalem is Israel's capital. That's not like touting that Jerusalem is truly the capital of Israel. That should go without saying. I mean, Jerusalem clearly is the capital of Israel. And not East and West. It's all of Jerusalem is really the capital of Israel. Because why? 1967, the war was won and Israel took Jerusalem. Plain and simple. All right? Now, it was part of Israel before the exile. And we have to remember, we went into exile not because we were the greatest nation on the world, earth, but because of our sins. We fell from grace. All right? So let's look at what's really going on. Why are these world leaders saying that, including President Trump? Why did he declare Jerusalem Israel's capital? Watch his verbiage. Watch what he's saying. Regardless of how the Pope has reacted to this, it's clearly every one of these leaders are parrots for Rome. They're parrots for the Vatican. Now you're going to know what the truth really is behind this story here. The parrots for the Vatican itself. And it's letting me know, all the way down to President Vladimir Putin of Russia, pulling his troops out of Syria because he knows that no doubt there may be 
planned unrest to come against Jerusalem. Let's take a look at some of these things that are going on. Now, as we say, stated already, Jerusalem, U.S. vetoes U.N. resolution rejecting Trump's declaration. It makes it look like that Trump was a great savior of Israel and did a great thing. No, President Trump is, is doing nothing but parroting exactly what the Vatican wants him to parrot, all right? No different than Erdogan, President Erdogan calling East Jerusalem the capital of Israel, correct? China calls for independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, December 15th. Okay, now, now watch these dates too. That's very important. Again, December the 6th, when this all got stirred up, is when President Donald Trump stands up and says, beginning of a new approach, President Trump declares Jerusalem Israel's capital. So when we begin to look after we see what uh, China and President Erdogan does, President uh, uh, Xi Jinping, all calling for East Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital, as I clearly state, they're only parroting what Rome wants to begin with. Now, President Trump on December the 6th, 2017, made this incredible announcement recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And of course, it sent the world into a, to a tailspin. The evangelical community and those supporting Israel all over the world were excited to hear President Trump's announcement, as was I was excited about it. But at the same time, I was very optimistically cautious. And I even brought that out in one of my broadcasts because I knew that Israel had already been divided. I knew that the city was divided. I knew that all the secret deals, we've shared that so much with you guys. And thinking, why do, what do people think that this is some kind of new deal or something? And some claiming that, oh wow, the, the uh, Erdogan and, and, and other leaders in the Middle East declaring that East Jerusalem is, is the uh, capital for Palestine, that they're inadvertently declaring Jerusalem, uh, West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. No friends, that's not the case. They are parroting what the Pope of Rome has been saying and not just Pope Francis going all the way back to Pope Pius XII, moving forward, Pope John Paul II, Pope uh, John Paul VI, all these different uh, uh, pontifical leaders and what they have stated about Jerusalem and how the land would be divided, this has all been going on the entire time. Nothing is different. So let's look at what President Trump actually says. Washington Post records here what Trump said in his Jerusalem address that should appeal to Muslims. Mm, wow, so I guess it's not just appealing to Israelis. Watch what happens here. Whoever crafted President Trump's Jerusalem address was well informed. Trump's speech aimed to soothe the hurtful feelings of Palestinians and to assure them that even though he was diverging from previous U.S. policy, he would care for what was most important to them. All right, so let me blow this up a little bit so you get a little bit better look at this. While recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, Trump took care to mention that the final borders of the Israeli sovereignty in the city are the moment disputed and should be determined by both parties. However, what was most significant for Palestinians and Muslims' ears was President's emphasis twice on the current status of Jerusalem's holiest and most contested site. Trump directly called for maintaining the status quo at the Temple Mount, also known as the Harim al-Sharif. Moreover, uh, addressing the future, he noted that Jerusalem is today must remain a place where Jews pray at the Western Wall and where Muslims worship at al Aska Mosque. For the Western audience, these words seem like a banal of affirmation of the obvious for the Muslim world and especially for the Palestinians. They are immense importance. In other words, Jerusalem on the east side is not the capital of Israel. Clearly, the po excuse me, the President of the United States, President Donald Trump, was echoing the Vatican's desire. He was ed editing the secret meeting going on with Shimon Perez, the son of Ahab, that is, uh, and that of, of course, the Vatican, uh, the officials there when they did the secret meeting while the Oslo Accords were going on uh, under President Clinton. That was nothing but, as uh, Joe Bannerman so eloquently puts it, the red herring in the room. All right, so that's the whole point, friends. No, this is not as much as we would love to say, finally the world, finally we have a president that's recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. No, he's only saying what the Pope has already said. All right, now that's the hardcore truth. 
I'm not here to tickle your ears. All right, I'm not a 501c corporation. And by the way, if you want to see something very interesting, this week we're loading a video called Let the Churches Remain Silent as Also Saith the Law. Now that's an interesting title, but wait till you hear the message behind it. Well, that's about the 501c corporations that are churches that get these tax-free money from those that donate. Uh, we don't have that status. We pay the taxes on the gifts that people give to us because we find that it's important to be able to have freedom of speech in what we say so we can tell you the truth and not kind of skirt around the issue there, not be a Vatican puppet out there. All right, so we're going to be bringing that message here on the Noon Institute. You'll probably want to see that. All right, let's move on, though. Because there's a lot of ground we got to cover today. Now, this may look like that President Trump wasn't so pleasing of the Pope of Rome, but you know, you have to have a charade, and that's what this is all about. That's why the violence between the nations are going on. This is why uh, the Pope goes against President Trump in his speech there, says UN, European Union, and Pope criticize Trump's Jerusalem announcement. They're just playing an act out for you, just like Erdogan is. Listen, if Erdogan was really against what President Trump said, declaring Jerusalem Israel's capital, do you think he would have went so far as to say, well, the East Jerusalem, by the way, is the Palestinians' capital? I mean, are we that dense? Sure, I know you guys are not. The guy, you guys that watch this channel, you guys are some smart people. You know better than that. You know, I'm not here to tickle your ears. You know, we already know the Bible speaks about there's those that have itching ears. They'll seek out those ministers that will tickle your ears and make everything sound like it's all great and fine and dandy and everything. And so you can send, and, and those that are doing all that nonsense, they'll send trolls over here to our channel to sit there and try to say, oh, he hates America. He's a Russian lover. Well, let me tell you something. Russia ain't doing so good on this issue either. And we're going to get into that here in just a little bit. No, I'm here to tell you what the truth is. And I'm not here to sugarcoat it or, or to sit there and whitewash everything and make everybody think everything's so rosy and cozy because I guess for some reason people have totally forgot about what Micah says and maybe it'll be a good idea to bring that up. Micah chapter 4 and let's look at what the prophet Micah says because yes Israel does return the house of Judah but says but in the days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow into it and many nations shall go and say come ye and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide concerning uh, mighty nations afar off and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth, uh, mouth of the Lord of the hosts has spoken. For let the peoples walk each one in the name of its God, but, uh, but we will walk in the name of the Lord. In that day, said the Lord, I will assemble her, watch, that are halteth, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. There's your, there's your Holocaust Jews, coming back crutches and wheelchairs and everything else, right? And I will make her that is halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a mighty nation of the Lord shall God shall reign over them in Mount Zion from thenceforth even forevermore. Now he's not talking about the ones that came in that the Pope of Rome, Pope Pius XII, so eloquently saved them out of the Holocaust and made sure they had the finest of everything and made sure that they became the first leaders of Israel in order to direct the future of the state to safeguard it for the Pope of Rome. No, he's not talking about that. He does talk about them, though, in verse 8. And thou, Migdal, utter the heel of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. Yea, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. All right, Migdal, utter the leaders of Israel. Now, why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perish? That pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now thou shalt go forth out of the city, and shalt dwell in the field, and shalt come even to Babylon, and there shalt thou be rescued, and there shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. In other words, the leaders of Israel don't seem to have enough brains to realize that Rome is not your friend. They're using you. 
Same goes for you, my Palestinian friends. Rome is not your friend. But clearly, they are using you. And we're going to get into that in Daniel chapter 11, verse 23. They are using you for their own gain. So this whole charade right now of, oh, East Jerusalem is a Palestinian capital. Well, President Trump says Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Yeah, but he leaves out the Temple Mount. Uh, he says the status quo will remain the same. Basically, President Trump said West Jerusalem is Israel's capital. All right? The only thing is he didn't use the word West. How do you make Jerusalem Israel's capital and then take away the Temple Mount, the most holiest site to Judaism? All right? And, and you might even question too. I mean, think about it. I've said this to you guys before. The Palestinians are Lot's children. And we're supposed to be able to get along with Lot's children. Didn't Abraham and Lot get along pretty good? They got along just fine. You know where the trouble came in? It was the shepherds. That's where the problem came in. It wasn't Lot and Abraham, and it wasn't the sheep. The sheep weren't trying to kill each other. It was the shepherds. It was the rabbis and the imams that are stirring up the whole mess in Israel. And of course, the imams and the rabbis are all being influenced by Esau. And Esau is stirring them up to the point to where Abraham has to go to Lot and says, Look, we can't have strife between us. And Abraham says, you choose which way you want to go. All because of the shepherds. Missed that one, didn't we? Oh, gosh, friends. I love you guys. I'm not picking on you particularly. But, you know, we got to say what the truth is so that the people that maybe st stumble across this video might understand what's really going on. All right? This is why we have to do this. We have to kind of make it hard and really sink it in because, you know what, friends? The people don't see it. They're, 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 so many people are deluded into thinking that, oh, wow, what they're doing over here declaring that, uh, East Jerusalem is the Palestinian capital. That's automatically saying that West Jerusalem is Israel's capital. That's acknowledging Israel has a right to the land. You know, that should go, to, go without saying. It is our ancestral homeland. And not just because of that. It's because that when Israel was declared to be a homeland for the Jewish people under the British mandate, not 1948, 1920, when they included all of the state of Israel and even what is considered today as Transjordan, that was supposed to be the Jewish homeland. Now, that was more land than what we were act actually given originally. Uh, but no doubt what it was was the Rothschilds had envisioned that they wanted to be able to take the entire region from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River. And this is why we see the wars going on that the U.S. is fighting for the Vatican to begin with. They're fighting Rome's wars. Sure they are. They send our guys over there to die. Uh, so we've been fighting Rome's war. We took Iraq, take Syria, take Lebanon. Uh, that's coming next. Don't have no fear. It will. Iran, of course, as well. But the main purpose is Syria. Syria is really a problem. And in fact, that's why Russia had to leave. Remember that Israeli foreign minister, uh, that, or not the foreign minister, but one Israeli minister that stood up there and said, if Russia wants to survive, they better get out of Syria. That's partly why Russia left, not the only reason. Now, let's look real quick. The Pope of Rome, he criticizes what President Trump is doing. He says, to respect the status quo of the city in accordance with the pertinent resolutions of the United Nations. Okay, that's what he's wanting them to do. Notice though what he says, though. Uh, as a final status issue. Uh, we, that's not only part I got there. Pope Francis said, I cannot remain silent. The United Nations Secretary General spoke of this great anxiety. The European Union expressed serious concern. American allies like Britain, France, Germany, and Italy all declared it a mistake. A chorus of international leaders criticized the Trump administration's decision on Wednesday to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, calling it a dangerous disruption that contra contravenes the United Nations resolution and could inflame one of the world's thorniest conflicts. Conflicts. That was an interesting choice of words, wasn't it? After all, Joel Bannerman says that the Vatican wants to make sure they bring on their own version of the Messiah. So I do believe that this is being orchestrated by Rome, and it's all a charade. All right, let's look at some more. Why did Russia then, and notice so, Russia, December the 12th, Less than a week after President Trump makes his declaration, he sneaks into Syria. Doesn't tell President uh, Abbas that he's coming. And he actually 
goes there to meet with his own military. He does let him know once he's you know, getting close time to get there that he's going to be there. But he comes there specifically for one reason. To declare to his military that we have won the war and you're going home. Now that's actually for a couple of reasons. One, he's going to run on an independent ticket. Uh, he's going to run another term for being president of Russia. So therefore, he needs to make sure he keeps to his pledge that he returns the troops home. It makes him look good. It makes President uh, Putin look like a hero. But I think it's much greater than that. I think that President Putin is playing into the hands of the Pope of Rome. Why? Because it may be that one of the key ingredients of this whole conflict here with Jerusalem, besides all these declarations, is to allow Turkey or another rogue military group or some fighting factions to come in and create a tremendous amount of unrest in Jerusalem. You have to do something in order to justify putting your UN forces there. And I think, this is just my conjecture, I believe that they're going to bring about an unrest in Jerusalem. Whether Jerusalem is attacked, whether it is by rioting, whether it's by ISIS, whatever the case may be, they're using this to justify it. This is why they had President Trump stir up the pot to begin with. President Trump declaring Jerusalem as Israel's capital infuriated the Middle East. With some help, of course. Because why? Now it's time to, as President Trump said, to officially recognize. And that's something, I don't even know if we even brought that up. Let me go back to that. What does President Trump say in his very first words? I have determined that it's time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, that sounds like to me it was a done deal, doesn't it to you? Officially recognize it? Oh, you mean to tell me, President Trump, you already knew that they already did it? Of course he did. You know, President Trump, he's a smart man, and I appreciate him in many, many areas. But I am seeing more and more and more, every single one of them, right down to President Putin, they all play Rome's games. Whatever the Vatican says, they do it. President Xi Jinping, clearly a Jesuit for Rome. I would have never thought that before, but I'm beginning to believe that now. Or at least I should say this, they're afraid. And they don't want to have to go to war with Rome's military that's getting out of control. And that's NATO's forces. That's not just, a, you know, the good men of, uh, and women of the United States that have fought for this country and have stood for democracy around the world always have believed that doing this for the right thing, having no idea that we've been fighting a lot of Rome's battles from the very beginning. Let's move on. If you look at the encyclical that was done by Pope Pius XII, this is going to kind of back up and show you the plans to internationalize Jerusalem from the beginning. Pope Pius XII, Redemptions Nostre on the Holy Land issue. The following is the official English translation of the encyclical letter, Redemptoris Nostri, our Redeemer, issued by his Oh, he's not the holiness, but anyway, Pope Pius XII on Good Friday, in which he proposes internationalizing of Jerusalem full protection of Christian rights in the Holy Land and the settlement based on justice of the refugee situation. The letter supplements the encyclical of multi placebius which the Holy Father issued last October. He's not a Holy Father either. But anyway, the Passion of Our Redeemer rendered present as it were to you to us during these days of holy week makes the minds of christians turn with deepest reverence to that land which divine providence providence will be uh, the cherished home country of the word incarnate in which uh, jesus uh, christ jesus lived his earthly life shed his blood and died i'll agree with that he did die for our sins in this very land but the whole point was as you notice in the letter here this is about internationalizing of jerusalem now this was done in 1949 this encyclical that he wrote but before then in 19 i believe it was 46 he was already meeting uh, with our second Prime Minister of Israel, Moshe Sharit, and was speaking about internationalizing Jerusalem. That was his desire from the very beginning. And of course, we can see um, 
Ah, uh, uh, thought I had that map. Yeah, here it is right here on your screen. This was the very map. That this was the original agreement to divide Israel into two states. And also, Jerusalem, as you can see on this map in red, was to be an international city, city with, uh, as they put it here, Corpus Separatum Jerusalem. All right, and Israel was getting even far more smaller than what they have now. The Gaza was going to go all the way down to here. The West Bank, uh, which is Judea and Samaria, taking a much larger portion of the land. The Palestinians actually rejected the deal. <laughs> you know, and, and really the Palestinians are Jordanians. Uh, the people in Gaza are Egyptians because during the Second World War, they were, they stopped, the, they would no longer allow the Jewish, uh, people, Jewish uh, people living in Europe to migrate to the land. And so for six years while they were being massacred in the Holocaust, and of course that was also another planned issue by the Vatican, so that only certain Jews went into the land so that they would be able to control the land. Now we know this because as we see uh, as well, uh, in 1948, when the when the uh, War of Independence was going to, was going to be fought, there was another group that was supposed to be part of the IDF forces that came in. It was under uh, Menachem Begin's command, who ended up becoming Prime Minister of Israel as well many many years later. And of course, once he made Prime Minister, they immediately went after him as well. I think that's what Mike Evans was doing was to actually to try to change him and bring him more in line with Rome's demand. Uh, but at any point here, uh, we had here, this is in the, uh, the Day in Jewish History by Haaretz, 1948, the, uh, the uh, Alta, Altalina armed ship reaches Israel and is attacked with friendly fire. It was Yitzhak Rabin who actually ordered the attack on this particular ship that was carrying tanks, weapons, armed supplies, and fighting men to help take Jerusalem. And they attacked them. They claimed that it was because they were worried that they were not going to take orders from the IDF. Well, they weren't because the IDF clearly had taken orders uh, who was being led by uh, uh, Moshe Sharit, the second prime minister, who was at that time the foreign minister of Israel, and that of Ben-Gurion. They were keeping in line with the Vatican's wishes to keep Jerusalem an international city. And this particular group, did not see that in, that in that way of thinking. They wanted Jerusalem to be captured for the Jewish people. And so they were coming to fight for that. And in turn, all these weapons that they acquired from the French government, that ship was sunk. And some, I think it was like a dozen of their men were murdered by Israelis, all because they wanted to keep Rome's status quo. Isn't that sick? I mean, that's just sick to me. You know, I mean, I, and I have to understand, Palestinian friends, let me, let me share something with you. I'm not here for going in there and, and, and just killing everybody or, or throwing the Palestinians out of the land. I think that we should be able to live together in peace. And we should be able to do it without all the wars. And the wars are being incited by Rome. Clear as day they're being incited by Rome. As I stated earlier, Lot and Abraham. It wasn't Lot and Abraham that had a problem with one another. It was rather the shepherds that were leading the flocks. And it wasn't the flocks. It was the shepherds. And as long as these ministers, whether they be rabbis or whether they be uh, Knesset members or whether they be Vatican uh, clergy or that of imams inside of the Palestinians or the Palestinian Authority itself, these are those shepherds that are leading the flocks astray. And that's why there's unrest. That's why it is the way it is. Now, moving on as well past that. As I stated before, we already know Israel had already been declared. It was already a two-state solution had been signed. Again, I want to play this clip here. This is, uh, the clip here is with uh, Simon Tov, my wife's interview with him. Very insightful interview there. I want you to hear a clip of this once again. In 67, 2000, and 2008, these are the dates that they were offered Palestinian state, but they refused. They didn't want to accept the offer, and they um, instead started Intifada, which we know, you know, that that happened. My husband was in a second Intifada, and he almost died in suicide attack. So, uh, but you have a different story than than 
Yehuda Gleik. He's saying that there's no more two states. Israel is one state. But you, you told my husband before that they have signed a two-state solution. Do you think, how did that happen? I want to hear briefly about that again, but do you think that there is some kind of secret deal that it's not being put up to public and there is some kind of secret deal going on uh, and something is plotting against the Jewish people? Definitely. You know, several years ago, and I can't remember the exact year, <clears throat> I was in a Bible study here in Jerusalem with several people and, and something unique happened during that Bible study. They received a phone call and they never answered the phone. <clears throat> and I was surprised when the wife of the family got up and went and answered the phone. She also happened to be a lieutenant in the police. Mm -hmm. And she gets, she's talking to this person and she goes off into another room. And a few minutes later comes back and asks us to pray for this woman that she just talked to, who was very much in distress. And she had been invited into a, the boardroom in the Knesset, Ariel Sharon, and a number of high, high, high level dignitaries from many nations were there and they reviewed maps of a future Palestinian state the total surrender of the city of Jerusalem, and it was agreed upon. It was, I believe, it was agreed upon prior to. This was a formality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so on the surface, the truth is that some of these people that were here in the nation were worthy of, of being not, noted, but the media were not aware of these people being here. We're talking leaders of nations were here. You understand what's happening then? Remember when President Trump says to officially recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital? But he leaves out the Temple Mount. Basically, he leaves out East Jerusalem. So, when I say that this is the Vatican doing it, we're going to get into that in just a moment here. Also, he does, uh, Shimon, uh, excuse me, Simon Tov goes into the infrastructure in this, as you guys may have heard before. This is one picture that we took. It's on the internet there. I didn't know where to find it myself, but I know I've posted it before. Uh, Israeli News Live says here on the bottom. This was one of those, they called it an eco bridge on Highway 1 that I said from the very beginning they would use this as a checkpoint. When Google Maps redrew the boundaries uh, of pre-1967 borders, that put this particular eco bridge, as they call it, just on the inside of Palestinian territory, in between where the Palestinian territory crosses Highway 1, and of course, it goes up to Jerusalem. We've seen this used as a checkpoint already in Israel recently after its construction was completed. Now, I want you to I actually speak about this just briefly, and this is the actual interview. I found it on Pinterest. I know it's on my channel, but I just don't know where. This is where I was actually interviewing Simon Tov about this. Listen just for a moment, this right here. Being built, uh, the, you know, why the Highway 1 coming up here? I have really believed that this could easily be altered into a checkpoint, although they are calling it uh, some kind of eco bridge, I believe is the name for it, so that the bunny rabbits can get from one side to the other. I, I don't know, Simon Tov, if they really think that the rabbits uh, are, are going to get it, or are they going to put signs out for them so they can get across the road. So we spent millions of dollars here in Israel to build this eco bridge that to me, and I believe it from the beginning, still hold to it, it is going to be a checkpoint in the near future as things change here. Your thoughts, my brother? You know, let me begin by about 13, 14 years ago, and I've been living in Jerusalem for most of the last 18 years, we had some good friends that lived in the Galilee, and we'd go up periodically to see them. Driving up the now, Simone will actually get into this on this particular right. video here, but to save time, I won't continue to play it. He does agree with the same, but he goes into the other checkpoints that he is aware of as well. Now, 
as all this is unfolding, one thing that I wanted to share with you guys that I think is very important is from Joel Bainerman. Because we talk about, again, East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, Israel's capital, uh, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem being the Palestinian capital. And as I stated, they're only echoing what the popes of Rome have already stated. Now, this was placed on Barry Chalmish's website. Uh, of course, Barry Chalmish has passed away. I knew Barry. Uh, he's been on Israeli News Live many times. And he was a very good friend with investigative journalist Joel Bainerman. They both were investigative Israeli journalists. And of course, he holds that Joel Bainerman was murdered. And of course, uh, he was telling me that they were out to kill him as well. That's Barry Chamish. Let's look at some of what he wrote here called the Vatican Agenda. How does the Vatican view the legitimacy of Israel's claim to Jerusalem? Here's what he says. And I'm not going to read everything, but I've highlighted extensively in this article because I think there are some very important things that you guys need to hear about on this. He said, most Israelis have probably never thought very much about what the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, thinks about end-of-days theology. Jews themselves don't give much thought to what will happen when Gog and Magog takes place. Jews don't go into for anything the least bit next world, but instead are firmly planted in the here and now. And he says, that's good. However, it does matter what Jews think what matters is it, does, it doesn't matter what Jews think what matters is what the Vatican believes and why it believes this Judaism and modern Jewish thought pretty much just dismisses the basic tenets of Catholicism outright and doesn't even bother addressing the core questions of what is behind Catholic theology claims. All right, moving down a little bit further, he says the institution of the Vatican is not understood by Israelis and Jews. The conventional wisdom you get from a spokesperson in the Israeli government ministries and the conventional Israeli media is both sides have a great intentions to do good. And that's about it. So he lets you know that the media doesn't really deal very much with it. As he continues later in the article, he says this, this essay will provide the background to deal as well as what the Vatican's intentions are regarding Israel and the old city of Jerusalem. It will reveal which Israeli politicians made certain comments to the Vatican regarding the issues of sovereignty in the old city of Jerusalem. These negotiations meetings were also carried out in secret during the time period of 1992 to 1995. The Oslo Accords was what got all the public's attention. Oslo was like throwing sand in the eyes of the public. The Vatican is where the real action was happening. Now, so he asked the question, what does the Vatican want? And this is where he starts off, here in yellow. It can't be that the Vatican is only interested in access to their holy sites in Jerusalem. They already have that, as well as legal jurisdiction under Israeli law for their institutions and assets in Jerusalem. Also, when these holy sites were under the jurisdiction of the Jordanians from 1948 to 1967, no pope demanded the internationalizing of Jerusalem. Now, that's where I disagree with him. Not publicly, but Pope Pius XII did declare it, and he also declared it in his encyclical. So Joel missed that particular one there, but I think it's worth noting that. Pope Pius XII did call in the encyclical in 1949 the internationalization of Jerusalem. All right, now, he goes on to say, the Vatican Roman Catholic's version of events is this. They know this isn't the end of the story that the Jewish God had in mind, but that doesn't mean that they won't try to engineer their own ending to their story. So what if, the, so what if it's fraudulent? Doesn't matter. That is their game plan, and that is what matters, and that is what Israeli Jews needs to be informed about. It is important for everyone to know that the Vatican, what the Vatican has up its sleeve because it is directly, directly relates to our existence, our future destiny, and independent nation. This is very powerful for us. There's a scheming to get control of the old city of Jerusalem, so you better know why and how the Vatican intends to do this. Now, Joel begins to lay out that scheme. Right here he says, first, you have to realize that for centuries the Vatican has attempted to obtain control of Jerusalem, which started in the Crusades. For them to convince the world that the Messiah that they put on the world stage is going to be accepted as genuine, they need to perform this play in the old city. The story is the production. Uh, and that is the Messiah will merge the three monotheistic religions, usher in peace and uh, har harmony in the world, and solve the Middle East conflict. The location of this production will be none other than 
the old city of Jerusalem. This is so-called Messiah that will be proclaimed will be false one and will insist that by having a world government, i.e. the United Nations, the world peace and harmony will be ushered in. This will be a lie and a fraud. But never mind in a world of reality as an important public perceptions are. So the point is, as he states, it's stripping Israel of their sovereignty. But here's what's interesting. The end result is stripping of Israel's sovereignty as an independent nation, giving way to a regional bloc of nations. Remember when President Trump talked about this one state solution, or well, they might make it two states? And he talked about these newly found partners of Israel? Here's your regional bloc of nations. By the way, Joel's been dead for a long time now. He passed away quite a while back. So it's interesting that he was seeing these things and writing about them long before President Trump ever came into office. More than a decade. All right? Goes on to say that the Jews uh, go a long way. They will convince them that the Messiah having appeared for the Jews, it is a time to start the rebuilding of the Third Temple, what they call Solomon's Temple. Now he goes on. Make no mistake about it. The old city of Jerusalem as well as the most of the eastern half of the city is what the Vatican is after. Why? Well, they're after it because they're, that's why they play the Palestinians. Because controlling the entire old city of Jerusalem and not just church properties and being able to build whatever they want on Mount Zion is critical for the program they have planned to put into play in our capital city. The deal that is signed with the Israeli via, via Yossi Balin and Shimon Perez in secret without approval of the Knesset gives the church not only extraterritorial status to their properties, which is what the bilateral agreement the Israeli government signed with the Vatican on December 30th, 1993 put into law, but of control over the entire city as custodians under UN presence. In this way, the Jews will give up control over the old city to the Vatican. The Israeli people would have, prob would have a problem with. To the UN, they would say, we had no choice. Hmm. So when you complain about what happens, They'll just tell you they had no choice. So as President Trump is touting that Jerusalem is Israel's capital and the evangelical world is all in, uh, in excitement and jubilation and celebration, it's not really peace. Remember what God said? Remember what Yeshua said? They will say, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Friends, be careful. Now he goes into the different areas where they were working to take the city and notice the verbiage and think about what these all these leaders have stated. Okay, what, what Erdogan has stated, what uh, Xi Jinping of China has stated, and other leaders have been stating about East Jerusalem being the Palestinian capital, and President Trump uh, not even including East Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He made, he made sure he was a little bit shy of that, and of course about the United Nations getting or the Vatican getting the UN, or excuse me, the old city. On October the 12th, 1991, the head of the World Jewish Congress, Edgar uh, Bronfman, is appointed head of the International Jewish Committee of Interreligious Co uh, Consultation to conduct official contacts with the Vatican and the State of Israel. You just need to know this for namesake. March 1992, on April the 1st, the Vatican announced that it favors a labor victory in the June 1992 general elections in Israel. On April 15th, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, what was that, Pope Benedict, right? One of the highest ranking diplomats of the Vatican visits Israel for the first time, but only meets with Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kolek. Hmm, wonder why. The story of the Catholic Church, Church's attempt to abscom with the old city of Jerusalem from the Jews begins in July of 1992. According to the information of the Foreign Ministry's website, literally from the moment the new uh, Rabin-led labor government took over from Yitzhak Shamir's defeated Likud party. Secret talks with the Vatican and the State of Israel began. Now don't forget, it was who? Yitzhak Rabin that ordered the attack on what ship? Alright, let's go back. Remember this now. He ordered the attack on the Altalina. Yitzhak Rabin ordered the attack on the Altalina off the coast of Tel Aviv to keep um, Menachem Begin's group 
from fighting for Jerusalem. Why? Because Pope Pius XII didn't want them to take Jerusalem. They wanted it as an international city. Okay? So, that's what Yitzhak Rabin did under the care of Ben-Gurion and Moshe Sharit, our Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Israel. So, now we go back then and we look at what it says here. Rabin laid government took over from Yitzhak Shamir's defeated Likud party. Secret talks with the Vatican and State of Israel began. What pre precipitated these secret talks? Who arranged these talks and why? Why were they kept secret from the Israeli public? What was the end result of these agreements? Where do they stand today? The entire subject of Israel's bilateral relations with the Vatican is intentionally kept locked away in secrecy. It is no wonder that nobody in Israel knows much about Israel's Vatican's relations as it never ever reported on, was reported on in the Israeli press. Hmm, I wonder why. November 1992, the document which was used on the underlying ideological basis for the Vatican secret deal with Yosef Balin and Shimon Perez was personally authored by Balin. The illegitimacy of Israel's so sovereignty over Jerusalem outlines the Israeli government's program on the future of Jerusalem and calls for the division of the old city in cantons and whose border posts will be under UN control. <laughs> There it is right there. That's the old city. That's the beginning, right? The plan which led to the December 1993 agreement between the Vatican and the State of Israel was originally discussed in November 1992 at the exact same time the first meeting in London took place to discuss an agreement between Israel and the PLO which led to the Oslo Agreements. The real goal was the Vatican attempt to take over the old city of Jerusalem. Oslo, or peace between Israel and the Palestinians, was just a cover story to hide what was really going on in another sphere of Israel's foreign affairs. Yeah. Go figure, right? September 1993, on the 10th of September, the three days before this, uh, the signing of the Oslo Accords, Washington, the Italian newspaper La Stampa, reported that Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, Ahab's son, concluded a secret deal with the Vatican to hand over sovereignty of Jerusalem's old city to the Vatican. The agreement, and it was included, the secret clauses of the Declaration of Principles signed on September 13, 1993 in Washington, D.C. And by the way, as a side note, I think the reason why Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated was because something must have not have gone right with the plan. And Barry Chamish clearly accused Shimon Perez and his assassination, orchestrating it, and showing in his argument that Yitzhak Rabin, the man that shot him in public, was not the fatal wound. The fatal wound come from a back shot that was fired, as Barry Chamish puts it, in the car that sped away with Yitzhak Rabin. He also blames Shimon Perez for the poisoning of Ariel Sharon that caused him to go into a coma and later die. It seems like that this man who went to a Jesuit school, according to Yitzhak Rabin's doc, uh, autobiography, had very close ties to the Pope of Rome. In the same week that Israeli Foreign Minister and Chief Oslo Architect Shimon Peres signed the Declaration of Principles, which Yasser Arafat in Washington, the Israeli Vatican Commission held a special meeting in Israel. Under the Vatican Agreement, the Israelis would give over control of the old city to the Vatican before the year 2000. The plan also calls for Jerusalem to become the second Vatican of the world with all three major religions represented, but under the authority of the Vatican. By the way, that happened actually in 2014 when the Pope of Rome held his first communion there. We'll get into that in a moment too. Jerusalem will remain the capital. Of, watch this. No, this is what gets me. All right. This is, a this is in 1993, September 13th. Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel, but the old city will be administered by the Vatican. Do you think President Trump was doing something to make it look great? because he had a great idea? No, Rome wanted him to do it. And it's just the way it's worked. They don't even call it West Jerusalem. They just simply call it Jerusalem will remain, Israel, will remain the capital of Israel, but the old city will be administered by the Vatican. And notice what President Trump did? 
Well, the status quo will remain the same. The, the Muslims will worship at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and of course, but he does say the Jews should still be allowed to worship there at the, at the uh, Wailing Wall. Yeah, because remember, the Vatican is going to allow all three religions to be in the old city. So he only parroted what Rome's already agreed upon. Arafat agreed to the plan just before the famous handshake, in 1993, but when he realized that the Vatican was also going to let Israel share in the Temple Mount, he rejected it. To get Arafat and the Palestinians on board on February 14, 2000, the PA did sign an agreement with the Vatican, which recognized the Palestinians' claims to what? To East Jerusalem! What do you know? The Vatican recognized the claim of the Palestinians to East Jerusalem. Why? To shut them up. Mm -hmm. Palestinian friends, you're just being used and don't even know it. It was signed, may have been part of the uh, commitment Arafat gave the Vatican as what he would do for him in return for the Vatican acknowledging Palestinian claims to East Jerusalem and the right to statehood. All right, now, and we already know, they recognize them as being a state already. The violence in the Middle East serves the Catholic Church's interests, especially where? Especially what? If Jerusalem is a subject to discuss. By Arafat getting guarantees from the Vatican that no matter what he does, the Europeans will not abandon him, then it makes sense for him to declare war on Israel in September 2000, the first intifada. I have a good friend of mine, he's a Palestinian, lives in Jerusalem. He told me, he says, Steve, he says, we lived in peace here in Jerusalem between Israelis and Palestinians. He said, I have friends who live in the Gaza. He said, always able to go back and forth and work until the first Intifada. He says, and why did we have an Intifada? He said, it never made sense to me. He says, and now the police harass my sons. He said, they always get picked up, taken to the police headquarters. He said, for what? And I told him, I said, listen, it's not your sons. It's not the Palestinian people or the Israeli people. I said, it's the leaders, and the Vatican is the one behind it all. November 1993, in a report in Jerusalem Weekly news, newspaper, Kol Hayer, it was revealed that for the past six months, the Israeli government has been taking advice on the future of Jerusalem from a planning commission headed by a close aide of Teddy Kolek and Renan Wyatz, formerly the settle, settlement director of the Jewish Agency at a secret meeting on September 9, 1993, and one day before Prime Minister Rabin signed the recognition of agreement with the PLO in Israel, the forum met secretly and approved in principle a plan for Jerusalem concocted by Wyatt's, which he calls Metropolitan Jerusalem. December 1993, which absolutely no media coverage in Israel, December 30th on historic agreement with the Vatican is publicly acknowledged, called the fundamental agreement between the Holy See and the State of Israel, it declares. Mindful of the singular character of the universal significance of the Holy Land, aware of the unique nature of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people, and of the historic process of rec uh, reconciliation and growth and mutual understanding and friendship between Catholics and Jews. Having decided on the 29th of July, 1992, to establish a bilateral permanent working commission in order to study and define together issues okay, of common interest and in a view of normalizing their relations already within one month of taking power, there was a special committee to further Israeli-Vatican relations from where did this initiative come so soon as the new government took office. <laughs> Friends, I mean, I'm telling you, this has been a done deal. Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Shemuel Mir, announces at Jerusalem press conference in 1994 that he had received information that properties promised to the Vatican and Jerusalem would be granted extraterritorial status. Early 1996, Mir was killed in a very suspicious car crash whereby the driver who drove a UN truck into Mir's car was not even charged. I guess he was speaking about something they didn't want him to open his mouth about. May 1994, Merrick Hotler, a French intellectual philosopher and a close friend of Perez, tells the Israeli weekly magazine Hashishi that he personally delivered a letter from Perez to the Pope in September 1993, in which Perez promised to internationalize Jerusalem. 
granting the UN political control of the old city of Jerusalem and the Vatican hegemony over the holy sites within. The UN would give the PLO a capital within its new territory and East Jerusalem would become a kind of free trade zone of the world diplomacy. What did the Palestinians get again? The PLO, a capital within its new territory, and East Jerusalem would become a kind of free trade zone. Well, do you remember when John Kerry, let's look at this real quick, remember when John Kerry, uh, this announcement here, Kerry backs four billion Palestinian investment? That's just a governmental investment, that's, you know, do you know, though, that his wife also invested millions of dollars and many other politicians have invested millions of dollars in the West Bank? A free trade zone, right? Hmm. 1994, on June 15th, the Israeli government signs an agreement with the Vatican allowing the Catholic Church to participate in negotiations to determine the future of Jerusalem. 94 July, the Vatican's foreign minister, Jean-Louis Theron, announces in Amman, Jordan, before territorial problems are resolved, we have to find international guarantees to safeguard the uniqueness of the city of assurances that never again one party should claim Jerusalem as its possession. This is why, the, this is why all the unrest is being stirred up. It's to give an unrest a chance to bring about fighting so that Rome can declare peace. They must be getting ready to bring on the Antichrist. That's my thought. That must be what this is all about. Prepare the way for the Antichrist. Hmm. November 1994, Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, which according to the reports in Haaretz and Mariv and Yadat Chanot, Includes secret clauses concerning water and Jerusalem. The agreement had been negotiated in London eight months before between Rabin, King Hussein, and Lord Victor Mishkan. As part of the agreement, Jordan would receive control over the Islamic holy sites within a Vatican-controlled old city of Jerusalem. Do you see how much involvement the Vatican has had over all this? And do you think that all these leaders are not parroting to the Vatican today? March 1995, a cable from Israeli embassy in Rome, where the foreign ministry was in Jerusalem, was leaked to the radio station of Rut Shiva, confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. Two days later, the cable made front page haras and widely uh, dis uh, distributed minutes of a meeting with President Clinton in 1997. Pre Perez ended the cable with the words, as I had previously promised the Holy See. Did he hand, over, hand it over? Remember the Knesset Abraham uh, Shapira? announced in the Knesset that, they, that, that he had information that all Vatican property in Jerusalem was to become a tax exempt and that large tracts of real estate on Mount Zion were given to the Pope in per, 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 perpetuity. Hmm. Maybe that's why he also did the communion service on Mount Zion. Looks like the Pope owns it now. Large tracts on Mount Zion were given to Rome. Remember John Kerry's nine-month negotiations and everybody thought it ended with no two states? Oh no, there was a two-state deal, all right. But it's not between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's between the Vatican and, the Pal and, and, and Israel. This is what the deal is all about. A delegation from the Vatican met in Jerusalem in 1996, February, with Palestinian Authority Religious Affairs Minister Hassan to hope, Father Sergei Sebastian, Secretary General of the Vatican, announced that the Holy See recognizes the Palestinian sovereignty over East Jerusalem. And as we already know, they ended up becoming a state as well. On November 10th, the State of Israel and the Vatican signed 1997 legal personality agreement whereby the State of Israel agrees to assure full effect law to the legal uh, personality of the Catholic Church itself. And as he says, what that means in plain English is anyone's guess. Now, just to sum up some of this here in closing, Obadiah, the Pope of Rome, after that nine-month negotiations within less than 30 days, drank upon the holy mountain, Mount Zion, showing that, yes, they did get a hold of large tracts of Mount Zion. That was, in other words, their settlement agreement with Israel. Uh, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. That is masculine plural. And clearly, you guys already know, the Pope drank with only men that day. And the nations would continually drink down. Oh my gosh, friends. What can we say? What could we say more? 
This is nothing but a charade, and they're making way for the Antichrist. Who will they pick to be their Messiah? I'm curious to see myself. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Tune in to the Noon Institute here in the next couple of days. We'll be doing other news here coming up this week too. But tune in. You're going to want to see the churches. Let them remain silent, as also saith the law. That'll be an interesting broadcast, as well as the broadcast I'll be doing on uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 and the real meaning behind that. If it's a blessing to you, the, the, the message that you're hearing, this news that you're hearing, hearing the truth, stand with us, support this work. Without your help, it's not possible. And I, I apologize us being on the road so much here, um, trying to work with my wife, trying to get her treatment. She is beginning to actually feel a little bit better, but it's still very difficult and still a long way to go. Just wanted to let you know about that. But if you'd like to uh, keep this broadcast going, visit IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can support there online. You can also send your contribution by mail. We have an address here in the United States as well as still in the Czech Republic that'll appear here on the screen here at the end of the broadcast and even on our YouTube channel directly right there on the main page of YouTube there. You will see right under the subscribe button a link you can help support this broadcast there. Shalom and God bless you.